Welcome to The Resilient Recruiter. I'm Mark Whitby. My special guest today is Natasha Makijani. Natasha is the CEO of Oliver Sanderson Group and the co-founder of Snap CV, which is a mobile job app and video platform. Oliver Sanderson is an exec search firm offering permanent and interim solutions to FTSE 100 and 250 clients delivering globally. Prior to starting Oliver Sanderson in 2011, Natasha started her recruiting career with Hayes, and then she was a top biller and managing consultant with Michael Page. She's got a amazing story of highs and lows on her entrepreneurial journey as a female minority CEO and tech startup founder. Welcome, Natasha. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Great to be here today, and thank you, um, Mark. So, Natasha, tell me the story of setting up Oliver Sanderson, you know, why you started the business and, and what it was like in the early days uh, and, and how that's developed to the present day. So we started Oliver Sanderson, I started Oliver Sanderson in 2011. And um, initially I set up from my parents' house. Um, so literally I rented out my flat, sold my car and set up from uh, my parents' house and, and took the business to the next level. So first couple of years, it was just myself um, and then one of my co-founders, uh, Susan and Ash, and we took the business to the next level. Um, initially, it was uh, growing the business, going out to FTSE 100, FTSE 250 clients and literally opening doors, building relationships at sea level and taking it to the next level in the perm space. So we had no debts, no loans, no overdrafts, and we just grew the business to the next level um, and opening doors and, and building relationships. One of our clients in year one gave us 150 roles that allowed us to bounce. And I'm talking about sea level suite right from, you know, their entire senior leadership and their exec board right through to their, you know, on site general managers ops people so we would literally recruit their finance director and then recruit an entire finance team for them or we would recruit their operations director and then recruit an entire ops team for them so they would turn and we were turning around these roles pretty quickly in four to six weeks and they were paying us which is quite unheard of they were paying us in seven days which is doesn't happen anymore, obviously. So that was my initial setup of Oliver Sanson. Um, so we operated from home for the first few years and we took it to the next level. And I got, I had five consultants operating from home and I was on the road three days a week. And then uh, we decided to come back to London. So I um, rented my, I, I, I moved back to my flat in St. John's Wood and we took offices in Upper Berkeley Street in Marble Arch. So where we sit today, we have Oliver Sanson Group PLC, Oliver Sanson Perm and Oliver Sanson Interim. And then we have OS Innovation, which is our sister company, which is Snap CV, which we'll talk about a bit later. So within Oliver Sanson Perm and Interim, we recruit um, exec search and senior leadership um, for clients for FTSE 100, for FTSE 250, so for clients such as British Airways, Arriva, Gate Group, just to give you an example of some of the, the names and the brands that we work with, uh, SGN, Gas Utility Networks, um, and the list goes on, Onji, um, are some of the brands. Um, and basically, We've now taken the team to a solid, strong team of 10 in the UK um, from a recruiter space, and we've got a research team of 10. And the key has been for us, our success has been, is passion, drive, energy, to take Oliver Sanson to the next level. Um, and our next step really for growing Oliver Sanson is now to go global. So we are gonna be looking for exec search people in um, America, in the Netherlands, potentially, potentially in India. So I'm looking at different markets and hopefully gonna be working with a couple of my NEDs to look at how we can take that forward. Wow, that is uh, an amazing, you know, journey in such a such a short time. Natasha, um, I'd like to go back to a couple of things you mentioned there. One is um, you were just a like one person business, but you were breaking into major, you know, blue chip companies and being given all these roles and and it, like at C level how did you how did you manage that or how so, did you accomplish that i should say so basically i guess um when i was at michael page my biggest my biggest strength has always been opening a door i guess some people call it business development um i call it networking and building relationships and just being genuine so my biggest strength is opening a door connecting with ceos connecting with chief people officers um connecting with group chairmen and basically meeting them uh building a relationship i don't go in with the uh, i don't go in with the premise that i want business from you and that's 
not the way I build a relationship. I think, you know, the key to success is that you have your short term gains, your medium term and your long term gains. And for me, it was about mapping out the, the people that I wanted to connect with and build relationships with. A lot of my clients are not just my clients. They become my friends. They become my mentors. And I we genuinely as a business build relationships. So I think it was just about opening those doors, being very genuine, very real. And I guess giving them a level of service that they've not received before. So the key here is that we open a door, we go above and beyond our competitors. And I think the market has been crying out for players globally. Um, Fortune, you know, FTSE 100, FTSE 250, uh, Fortune 500 businesses have been crying out for brands that are come in and say, look, we can be outside of the norm. We can be innovative. We can work with you. You know, th the bigger players in certain aspects, um, they're great and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're my competitors, but they're also great at what they do. But you know, they'll take three months to potentially deliver a retainer. Um, we would deliver retainers back to back in four weeks and we'd go in with, a, you know, sh stronger rates. Um, but more than that, our service levels right until the point of delivery is what we give our customers. So proof is in the pudding. So, you know, if you're good at what you do, you're not frightened of t um, taking an assignment and turning it on its head and thinking outside of the box. And I think that's what my clients love about us. Could you say more about um, the specifics? Like, it seems like you have um, a really, you know, uh, um, amazing way to build rapport quickly with senior executives. And maybe it's your your very refreshing approach. You're sincere. Um, you're enthusiastic. But you know, how are you creating that? Um, I would say that comes from my passion. Um, I love what I do. Um, and I think my team as well, we love uh, Oliver Sonson. It's our values. It's our beliefs. It's the fact that we absolutely love what we do. And I personally, um, I've always been somebody that says, no matter if you're running a business, you should always keep your um, hand in the, you know, your foot in the water. You should actually be able to deliver. So for me, it was always about um, being able to constantly build a relationship with clients. And I think um, it's just my passion. It's just you know, there is nothing more gratifying than being able to introduce a candidate to a client, know that they're right. And quite often when you, know, you know, the key here is that I always understand my client's businesses. I understand what, what their, you know, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are their forecasts? And I help them look at their, their war for talent. So therefore it's not just about placing a role with them and winning a retainer or winning an interim exec search assignment. It literally is about going, where is your business struggling? What areas are you looking to build talent? And what we do is we then forecast and map for them and we give them samples to say, look, this is what exists in the market space. What do you think? And therefore, quite often, a lot of our placements come from uh, non-obligation coffees or, you know, just putting the right candidate at the right place at the right time with the right CEO and the right chief people officer. And a lot of my clients will say, this is what we potentially struggled with, or this is what we might be looking for in the next 18 months. So it's not about gaining a quick win now. I think the problem that a, a lot of recruiters struggle with is they think about the short term now. And what we need to think about is, well, yes, you want to, you want to meet that individual. You want to build a relationship with that client. It might take you two years to get there. It doesn't matter if it takes you two or three years to get there. There will be certain wins that you will gain now and those wins will be great. And then off the back of that, you'll build stronger relationships and people will network with you. But there will be relationships where you might open a door now, but it might take you two years or three years before you see any work from them, you know, and, and that's the key to building your confidence, I think, is to building the client's confidence that you've got the ability to deliver at a fast pace if they need it, you've got the ability to drive and add value to their business and become an extension. So for example, one of the clients that gave us 150 roles, they did not have a central resourcing function. Today they do. So what we do for them now looks very different to what we did from them, you know, back in 2011 and 2012. However, that client at that time, you know, the HR director and the head of HR, they didn't have a resourcing function. So we became that and they would call in 10 or 15 roles a week to us 
Friday, you know, Friday night, when do you need to turn around? Some of those were exact search. So it would be, you know, a couple of weeks, we would turn them around. But the the smaller roles at that particular time for that customer that we did, because it was our early days, we would turn those around within a few days. Uh, so literally 24, 48 hours for our clients. And that's, I think, the level of service we provide, which is unheard of to the extreme extremities that we go. I think that's what made us successful. I don't even know how you do that. I'd like to break into that a little bit. But first, um, talk to me about this long term thinking and relationship building. Obviously, it's worked for you, you know, really well. And to the point that some of your former clients have actually become mentors for you and are non-exec directors in in the business and so on. Um, But, you know, when how do you approach that conversation? What do you talk like if it's not to get business right now and it may take you months or even years to really uh, break into that business? Um, you know, what what's your approach to that and, and what what's the conversation like? So it's so for us, it's about building a relationship with them over time. So it's about breaking down um, what what it is each individual uh, potential client, because they're not just clients, they're people at the end of the day and their businesses. And in those businesses, they've got a forecast agenda. So, for example, coronavirus has come up. A lot of my clients did not know um, this was going to happen and they're now putting strategies in place. So you've got board level people that will have put strategies in place of what their business needs now, but what their business needs over the next 6, 12, 18 months to three years. So what you do is you work with them uh, to say, look, you know, throw me one or two roles now. But if at any point you're ready to try us at any point, so whether it is, uh, you know, a retained assignment or an interim, an interim quick turnaround role, or whether it is a uh, a longer term gain where you want to build a talent pipeline, where we can do salary surveys and benchmarking. So what Oliver Sanson do is we go in and offer free salary surveys, benchmarking, talent pipelines. And what we do is we, we go in and we deliver that to them and we become, we add value to those businesses. Um, or our clients will call up and say, we want a customer insight into a particular area that we're not sure about, or we're not sure what, what does this mean? What does this mean for our business? Because we want to plan. So then we work with them in certain other areas so because we give an added value service in other spaces then when they're ready to deliver that retainer they potentially come to us and I think it's also sometimes a CEO will just say Natasha I'm not looking now or a HR director will say I'm not looking now but I might be looking for this type of individual do you think you could just keep an eye out or could you you know or we regularly have a need for MDs in this space or we regularly have a need for operations directors of this level So what we then do is we keep an eye out in the market. And when we find a candidate that might be relevant to them, we'll then just drop them an email. But we'll ask the permission first. We don't just, and I think the key here is we don't just blanket spec. What we do is we target specific. We, you know, we get to know our markets, we get to know our clients, we get to know their strengths, their weaknesses, what they're going through. And then we work with them over time to build those relationships. And I think the key here is I, we always go out and see our clients. Obviously at the moment that's not possible. So it's Zoom, but we, we build relationships. So we, we do a lot of breakfast, a lot of client lunches, dinners, and we just connect and then slowly in time once people can see that we're building those relationships and they can see the ability that we'll deliver and I always you know I always throw to them and say well actually proof is in the pudding just throw us one assignment see what we deliver and then from there if you're happy then you can throw more work our way so for them it's about getting to know us um and see the way we work and see if they're comfortable with what the way we deliver um you know and that's kind of how I've always approached things. I don't think you necessarily need to win everything from a client straight off. It's building in slow, slow blocks. Mm, okay, awesome. So those value added things that you mentioned, uh, such as the you know salary surveys, the talent pipelining, and so on, is that done for free as a way of building a relationship, or is that a separate chargeable service? So technically in a business, that would be a chargeable service Um, and um, moving forward as we grow in certain aspects, we will potentially um, look at that moving forward from a commercial point of view. However, at the moment and has been for certain clients, if we're building a relationship over time, some of those services have been where we'll go, we'll do this for free um, if you can guarantee a certain amounts of work. So what we've done is gone in and said, you know, 
to a client, okay, we'll do some work to just demonstrate what we can do for you versus some of the other players. Once we've delivered to a certain level, clients gladly will then say, well, actually, you deli- you know, you're delivering in four weeks, you're doing it back to back, you're the speed of delivery, the service that you deliver, um, and, you know, and we go until we deliver. So the difference is we won't just say, here's five CVs and that's it. We'll be like, well, here's the CVs, but here's, we've got backups as well. Um, and we'll work with the client till they get to the outcome of an offer and acceptance. So we, you know, so all the talent pipelining we do, we know potentially some of it may go to an offer, some of it may not. It will literally just be, they want to see what exists in the market space. But what we generally try, try and do is put a project plan together with the client of what are their requirements? What do they need as a business? Is it talent pipelining? Is it salary surveys? Is it added value? Do they need someone to help forecast? Do they want to interview in certain spaces? So yeah, I mean, for us, it's but, but I believe that because we put a service in to them and we become an extension to their function um, because we genuinely care, I think that's why then they they are loyal to us and they give us the work that we have so you know that we've obtained over the years. So I think it's a two way street. Natasha, I I still am I'm really curious how you get your foot in the door because you know getting a, a CEO or C level person to talk to a recruiter when they may not have an, an immediate need and they have other resources they could they could turn to already. You know what? What? How are you starting the the conversations? So it is genuinely going in quite gentle. Um, mm-hmm. It isn't going in with a sales approach because I don't. I don't believe what we do is selling. Genuinely, people will say we are selling. Recruitment is sales, um, and unfortunately, that sort of puts us in a different light. And I believe it's about building relationships slowly but surely. So I genuinely just might drop them an email or say, "Would you want to meet for a breakfast?" Obviously, before coronavirus, um, you know, I would meet them for a coffee or just connect with them and. And then what I often do is I read up on CEOs, I read up on chief people officers. So I follow their careers. So for example, Susie Robinson, um, uh, group HR director of DHL, um, she's now an NED on my business and I've worked closely with her over the last few years. However, I followed Susie for over 12, 13 years um, and followed her career and how she built her career. And then I delivered um, a couple of her head, HR directors for her team, I actually put a few of them into DHL. And the key there was, is that I, I watched them, how they, as they grow, I grow with them. And then I open those doors. And then quite often, for example, we've had a couple of networking events. I'll approach a HR director, uh, so for, for example, Sharon Doherty, who is somebody I really admire, who is now the chief people officer of Finastra. She was number two at Vodafone. Um, and I followed her for quite a few years. And then I connected with her and I built a relationship with her. And then I asked Sharon, would she do a talk for us? And she did a talk on digital transformation and we, um, at Home House. And we had a networking event about 18 months ago. And when she did the talk, we had the whole FTSE 50 literally show up because it was Vodafone and it was all on digital. Um, but because I built a relationship with her over time and then I genuinely said to her look you know it would really be great if you could do something you know so we hold networking events that CEOs are interested in or chief people officers are interested in and then we just go I just go in very slowly I don't go in harsh and genuinely um, I think the key here is that a lot of CEOs and HR directors and chairmen I think the key is that they have they're used to the big brands but they are looking for something different and outside of the box. And I think they found our approach refreshing. And I think they found us slightly different and unique. And I think that's um, why they've encouraged, you know, once you kind of open a door and you get to meet them and then you tell them about your story and your journey, I think a lot of them just genuinely want to support you because they want to see you flourish, which is great. And I think that is the key to it is that, you know, we go till the end and, you know, and, and the, the difference is we're flexible. So we'll flex according to the client's needs. I think the key here is that it, you have to be adaptable. Um, I also think they've been quite um, supportive because we've gone down the tech and digital route. So because we've launched, you know, Oliver Sanson Group PLC and then Oliver Sanson um, Snap CV Group PLC. And because we've gone down the digital route, I think that has also been an opening for us that other other search firms don't have um, because we've gone global with that. You know, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story 
uh, during this interview. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we're slightly different to the norm. Um, you know, for example, when we deliver a retainer, I can deliver full on pre-recorded video interviews with your competency based interview notes. So it's not just competency based interviewing and actually the pre-recorded video interview software snap in view is our own technology. So we can offer it for free every time we deliver a retainer. Other players can't do that. They'd have to pay for that. We don't have to. So that's not a charge to us. I can put 2000 interviews through because it's not a charge to me as, um, as an individual because my business owns that. So if I want to, I can deliver it to a customer. That's what attracts them. Got it. Okay, I'm I'm getting a picture here, Natasha. So I'd love to hear more about Snap CV in a second. Yes. It sounds like that's a really you know good differentiator for you guys. Yeah. Um, I now understand. So it's a, your approach is very strategic and targeted, and you know a lot about your prospects before you even reach out to them. Yeah, absolutely. So the research that we do behind them, following their careers, building a knowledge base behind them. And genuinely, so what I've always done is for the last 20 years, since I've been in recruitment, I literally have had a target list of who I want to meet, why I want to connect with them. And at some point in my life, I'm going to meet them. And if it takes me, you know, some people I'll meet within 18 months, some people it might take me five years. The difference with a lot of recruiters um, to now these days, and I guess it's more in that millennial space, is that you don't give up. And that's what I would say to the millennials that don't give up. You know, certain targets you will get to really quickly. Certain people will take time. But I think it's because I'm inspired by those people and because I find them inspirational um, that I follow their stories, I follow their journey, I understand what's going on and I try and learn about them as much as I can before I get to them. And I know it might take me a long time. Um, I guess the perseverance is the key. Don't give up. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to have, with recruitment, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days. And the key to really building a business and building relationships with clients is, you know, have those target lists and know that some of those people will take you a little bit longer to get to. And then once you've got a few of those people, then the rest do come, they do follow. So, it, you know, it takes you from one level to another level and they just follow that, you know, it's, it's, what, it's, it's a natural progression and I also think that once I've opened a few doors um, as our, as the business has grown as we've built our reputation as certain clients see that oh wow they're working with this customer or they're working with British Airways for example or they've been working with Areva or they've been working with DHL when people see some of the clients that we've been working with or they see some of the articles then they you know you start to have a presence in the market space and people go oh wow okay so if they're using them maybe we want to work with them so now whereas you know eight nine years ago we would have called up for business today um, roles are called into us so we're on a number of preferred supplier lists but we have a lot of clients that we've got good relationships where they'll call us or there'll be people that I know from industry. Um, they haven't used me yet, but all of a sudden they'll go, actually, we wouldn't mind using you. Would you be, you know, they'll, they'll pick up the phone and saying, you know, we, we've worked, we've had this assignment here or, you know, we've had a service like this and we, we haven't been happy. Um, and I think the key here is that you don't, I think the exec search firms are brilliant and they're amazing at what they do, but I think what, what they do is the, the charge rates on where they're at, um, sort of the third, a third, a third. If you're aggressively going to stay in that space, especially now with coronavirus, potentially a recession coming, um, you've got to think outside of the box. You've got to be innovative. And if you are innovative, um, it will naturally pay for itself. You know, and I think for us, we don't chase the money. We 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 chase the people. We chase building the relationship. For me, it's about the client and the candidate. If those are successful, everything else comes. The other thing is, a candidate can become a client. A client can become a candidate. So, if you naturally think every meeting, every connection is a potential customer, and it doesn't matter what level they're at, and you respect everyone the same, and you give everyone the same amount of respect and loyalty, you will always be successful and I think that's been my motto amazing I love it so I like the fact that you've got this target list of people that you want to meet and it's not necessarily about I'm going to sell to that person but these are people I admire I've, I've followed their careers and sooner or later I'm going to create an opportunity to meet that person and then subsequent to that some of them come on board as customers 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's, that's the interesting thing is that some of those people will come on as customers. Some of those people may just end up being friends and mentors. Some of those people um, may come on and do a networking event for me. So may host a breakfast club event or a dinner event. We've had a couple of those, as I've said, over the last few years. So they, they pay attention in, in that space. Mm. So I think that's really a, an interesting part for us is that I don't expect to meet somebody and tomorrow get business from them. I think if, you know, or, you know, obtain business from them. I think if you think that way, then you're only looking out for the short term. And I think reputation is everything. So, you know, when I open the door and if if someone says, you, you look interesting, but I've always I've always worked with this side of things. Um, I'll say, look, proof is in the pudding. If you want to give me an assignment and you want to give Oliver Sanson a chance, give us a chance. If you're not ready at this stage, that's fine. If and when you're ready, that, that that's fine as well. Also, you will find that you have certain clients that will have relationships with other players and they're happy with those players. And you then say, that's fine. But at some point, if there is an assignment they cannot deliver... Um, or you want there's an unusual role and one of the things we love to do is I love to take a role um, and the business and some of my consultants who are very good I've got um, a couple of consultants that are really good at that where we'll take a role where perhaps it's been out with another player and it has been retained and they've had it for five or six months and they've not for some reason they've not been able to fill it and then the client comes to us and says, Natasha, I know, I know I've known you. We should have come to you. We didn't. Do you think you could take this assignment on? And they're like, but I've already paid an X amount of fee, you know, and they've been burned. And then at that point we go, okay, let us see what we can do. And we turn that around for them in the space of six weeks. And then their mouths are a little bit flabbergasted because they're like, how did you do that? So we work with them to correct whatever's happened there and turn it around to a success story. Another another thing I quite often find is that the one thing we do love is to take a role um, that has a really unusual job title because um, some exec search, some some global brands have certain roles where they'll have a certain job title, but actually what they're looking for is something completely different. The job title doesn't necessarily reflect what the client really wants. And then it's about you working with the client to break it down, to understand what is it they really want? What are the pros and cons? And then, you know, sometimes it's salary that they are, you know, they want the world for not the right salary or they um, have an expectation that just doesn't exist. So you cover the entire market for them and you say this is what exists in your price range this is what you know in your salary banding this is what exists you know slightly higher this is what exists if you want to pay a you know quite a bit more um or actually you know this doesn't actually exist but this is 90 percent of what you're going to get so what we do is we make sure we cover the entire market so when we can go back to our client we can say this is what you really want and this is you know this is what you you know you thought you wanted but these these are the the boundaries of what really exists and then breaking it down with them to say what do you want to do now and then they'll be like okay so let's interview a few of them uh, from that sort of things and that's where our snapping view tool where we do the pre-recorded video interviews allows them to get a feel for the candidates um, a little bit more in depth than just competency based notes and just us talking about them because they get a feel for the person in reality um, and then if they like the view of that then they'll say okay let's let's do the next stage and do either a face-to-face -face or now these days obviously it's a video interviewing um, you know like zoom and uh, uh, that sort of thing. All right, amazing. Just going back to the example you gave uh, a minute ago, Natasha, where you've got uh, a company has had a failed search with another firm. They come back and they come to you and say, Natasha, can you help us? Because this has not worked. What do you do? For, I mean, do you do anything for them on the fee? Because they've already paid a third or two thirds of the of the fee at that stage. So we work with them to because normally at that stage, what we do is we will work with them to look at the fee. But obviously, commercially, we are a business as well and we do have sure. to make money. So I can't just totally say I'm not going to charge you, um, you know, although I would love to, but it's not something we can do. So what we do is we work with them on a basis that we may charge them a certain percentage. It won't be necessarily as high as what they've paid. So it kind of on this assignment and then the next assignment, they will give us a full fee. So what they do is I, I, I get I work with them to say, let's take one and then potentially um, work with us. Because once we've delivered one assignment for them, they then move forward. But absolutely, if someone's been burnt, um, we work with them. And I, I think the key here is that um, 
we we don't we're not in it for the short term so it's not just about you know we place you and then somebody's there for 12 weeks and if they're not successful you know the relationships we have with our clients a lot of my clients have become NEDs or like I said friends and you build those relationships so they genuinely know if something goes wrong we'll you know we'll work with them to support them back because you don't it's not about a short term gain. Um, and as a business, um, if you are genuine and honest, success genuinely does come. Um, you know, you will be successful. The money part will just naturally come if you are great with your clients and your candidates. Obviously, you have to have a commercial edge to you. There is no doubt you're running a business. But if that, you know, if they'd always say, what's the key formula for a great recruiter? And if a recruiter, when you're interviewing, for example, a recruiter, if you say to a recruiter, they say money is the first thing I want versus success and achievement and client relationships, money should be in the top three, but it should be maybe number three, not necessarily number one. And it's interesting to see when you talk to salespeople that say money is the first thing I want great we all want money we all want to be rich we all want to, all want to be billionaires but that's not necessarily that's going to get you there you know you have you, you deliver a service your service speaks for itself people will come back time and time again and our key is repeat business all of our clients exactly. are repeat business you know, I, I think a lot of recruiters don't understand the concept of lifetime customer value LCV um, because you know, it's not just about making one placement, it's about making multiple placements over the course of years. You know, if you think that way, all of a sudden, each relationship is so valuable. Yeah, I would say to you, each relationship is really valuable and each relationship means something. So for example, certain clients you will work with over three or four years, five years, and then they might, you know, they might have been one of your best customers and then they, they slightly take a tear off because they're doing a restructure, they haven't got as much money, and you still support them through the good and the bad. You don't just leave their side because they're not giving you as much money. So one year you might bill an X amount, you know, and then the next year you may not bill as much with that customer. So at that point, certain recruiters will potentially leave the side of that client. Now, actually, if you support them through the good and the bad, they will come back for you. And my clients tend to, my clients and Oliver Sanson's clients and all of my recruiters, our clients tend to take us with them. So what happens is we don't only stay with the client that we're building in that relationship in that business. A lot of the HR directors and CEOs, when they go, they do take us with them. So the reputation we have is that we, you know, it, it's not about just client centric. It's about the individual centric as well. It's about having a relationship with those people. And they believe in us. Um, I, I think, you know, that's the that's the genuine side. I think, you know, they, they want to be part of our journey um, and they want to see us grow and they want to encourage us. Natasha, one thing I love about you is your, um, I mean, your enthusiasm is infectious and uh, you have the courage to aim for the most senior level of, um, of the organization. I think a lot of people are, are scared or intimidated to contact uh, a chairperson or, you know, CEO. How, where does that come from? What, what gives you the courage to reach out, you know, at the highest echelons of the, of, of the big, you know, biggest companies? Well, it's simple. If you go to the top, what they're going to do, they're going to so some of the top will talk to you. Some of them will not talk to you. They'll come back to you and say, we're not ready to talk to you. Or you'll just get a nice email saying, thanks, but no thanks. Um, but Or you'll get sent back down to head of resourcing um, and then you'll build a relationship. And then when a client says, don't, you know, you've written to the CEO, thank you for your email, but please don't, um, don't, don't contact the CEO, come through to the head of talent or the head of resourcing. Um, at that point, you do need to listen and build a relationship slowly and in, over time, because if you don't, then you'll never get into that business. So you take it slowly. Um, but it, I think the key here is that you can either work bottom upwards or you can work top downwards. And I've always had the strategy go top downwards because it's yes, easier yes. than bottom upwards, because bottom upwards will mean that, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to say no, or they're going to say, we're not ready to talk to you, or we currently work with this particular brand. You know, it's, it's about being quite thick skinned and not being frightened. But yeah, there are certain CEOs and there are certain HR directors and chief people officers and CFOs that, you know, I've got on my target list and I know I want to meet them one day. And for me, it's not even about getting business or obtaining business. Yes, I want Oliver Sanderson to grow. Um, my team want Oliver Sanderson to grow. And we, you know, we're looking to grow glo go global now. And, you know, that is key to taking the PLC business forward. However, 
um, it's about building a relationship. Some of those people are just absolutely inspirational. And so for us, the journey is, for me per and for me personally is, I would like to just meet that person to find out about them and how they got there and how did they take that journey forward and, you know, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses? Um, because by meeting those kind of people, it's, it's kind of like it rubs off on you and you, you know, and I see it, you know, if you've emailed... 30 people and you've contacted you know 10 of them have responded or even three have responded and you get one one bite that's one bite you didn't have yesterday and that's the key um and that key, you know and that could be gold dust i i agree 100 percent about the top down strategy is way way better for so many reasons but one of them is you get treated by the client at the same level that you are interfacing with our organization so if you are dealing with a CEO, you get treated like a CEO. If you are dealing with the, you know, a really junior person, you get treated as a junior person as well. So the sort of, you know, mutual respect that you get by going in higher is, uh, is huge in terms of how the relationship then can progress. Um, let me pick up on something you, you touched on, which I think a lot of recruitment business owners can relate to is you, you said you grew too quickly. Could you say a little bit about that? What happened and what did you learn from it? Yeah, so we were a team of five um, and then we got our offices in London. We, we took offices in London about six and a half years ago. And I, uh, took, a t I took my team from sort of six or seven to a team of uh, 20 pretty much overnight. Um, and I think sometimes business owners myself being you know part of that you can grow a business too quickly too soon um and perhaps i had just taken the wrong people um it's just one of those mistakes that most people can make however from there i uh, maria simovic who is one of my neds who is at who was actually our iag she was a ceo of harry ramsden's she's at alvarez um and she's actually an investor in oliver sanson but she's also uh, an ned she helped me to pull the business apart put it back together so what we've done now is financially we've come out really strong and stronger than before so we've got a really solid team of 10 recruiters that are really strong and solid and then we've got our um, research team that do the mapping which is another 10 so what what she did is she took the team of 20 recruiters she looked at who were not successful and we had to um we had to sort of make some changes and restructure it. And financially, we're now, you know, two years on, we're two, two, two and a half years on, we're in a really strong place and we're going places and we're in the right direction with the right people and the right learning program for the people that I do have in place. So I think sometimes as a CEO and as a founder, um, your passion um, and your energy has to be channeled in the right way. And that's that's what I've now learned and I'm still learning every day. And I think any CEO that says that they are not learning along the way, you're always learning. So as long as you're positive and you're learning and you take from other people, um, you know, and I think that that's the key to sort of making sure that you learn from your mistakes and you're not frightened and to get up and stand up again. Because, you know, they, they always say if you if you, you know, if, if it gets tough, just get back up and just make it happen. And, and that's what we've done. And that's what we're doing. And, you know, and the business is still in going through, you know, going to a strong place right now. Fantastic. So what adjustments did you make to your internal hiring process in order to make sure that you have the right people on the bus? So our interview processes. So first of all, we went in and we invested in psychometric testing. So that was the first port of call. The second port of call is um, the way we would headhunt candidates. Um, and we wouldn't expect a recruiter to um, just come in very quickly and take them on. So it would be perhaps four or five stages interview process to make sure that if they're going to commit to us, they're going to be the right level. Um, and the difference is if we've brought in a combination of some senior hires, but we've also brought in uh, people that we've turned into recruiters. So we've actually trained our own. So we've got a full 18 week learning program and we work and we and then we cater to the training of each individual. So we look at their strengths and weakness. We put them through the 18 week learning program um, once they come on board at every level so I think the you know the internal process was four to five stage interview process psychometric testing um, and then make sure that they're really committed that if they're joining us they know that the truth they're comfortable with it and they want to become founders um, and the key for us is that you know 
even now, like we're looking to grow the business even during coronavirus and, and what's going on. And I actually think the new norm may mean that there are going to be recruiters out there that don't want to go back to an office-based environment, although we do have offices in Marble Arch to offer to, to staff that want to still come in. Um, I think there are going to be a lot of uh, exec search recruiters who perhaps work for some of the big corporates who perhaps don't know how to set up on their own, are a great recruiter, but they're not sure what next they they want to do something different and I, and I think that's where we're going to be able to capture the market where you know you come in you prove yourselves there's opportunity to gain shares we are now growing you know we've got all the Samsung group plc we've got our perm and our uh, interim business and we're growing our business globally um you know and that's the key is that the difference with us is that we can offer equity in shares we can offer the opportunity to grow um, and build a business within a business uh, which i think yes you can do at the at the bigger players and you know that's i have all respect for them but i think the difference is that we um we're now able to attract people in a, a different light than perhaps what we were a few years ago and we changed the way we recruited so you know and it's not just me interviewing now it's uh, an entire NED board that will make those decisions with me to confirm who we're going to bring on, who, who we're going to bring on board. And those individuals don't just answer to me; they answer to the board as well. Awesome! That makes a lot of sense, Natasha. Tell me about Snap CV, how that came about, and what what do you guys actually do? What is that technology about? So Snap CV Group PLC started a few years ago with my one of my co-founders, and we noticed there was a gap in the market space. And when we noticed that there was a gap in the market space, we designed a mobile job app called Snap CV, where basically it's all about direct hiring, where you have mini sites and microsites. Um, it's a mobile job app where a candidate can attach a 60 second video of themselves with their CV or answering five key questions. So you don't have to have a CV. So that's gone potentially gone other days of a full CV and it goes straight through to the hiring manager. So for example, clients like SGN, Gas Utility Networks, or clients such as Gate Group may use the, have used this, um, the tool, or Onji have you have used Snap CV, and basically the candidates go straight through to the direct direct team. And say the hiring manager has received 500 applications for engineers, as an example, SGN Gas Utility Networks, they can then pick out the. 50 that they're interested in um, and they can watch those 60 second videos they can then set up an interview what we've done as our second phase for snap cv is we've then gone one stage further where we've got a drag and drop facility and we've actually within so say suppose sgn have picked out those 50 people they drag and drop facility and they can invite those candidates to do a pre-recorded video interview via our snap in view tool which is the video platform so they then do a pre-recorded video interview and that's your first interview done in a snap what then happens with that is that goes again through to the hiring managers and you can score those and the hiring manager can then decide that's your first stage done who we want to bring in for the next phase we are going into whole uh, phase phase two is going to be around ai artificial intelligence um, we are also looking at um, with snap cv um, and snapping view we are looking at the, the next phase of not just ai um, but a few other things around assessment centers um, and also one of the platforms that we have within snap cv is we've got the internal job function so if a client just wants to advertise internally the roles that they've got and they want to build their internal talent pipelines as long as you've got an email address from that company, uh, your internal your internal community can only view those vacancies. So if they don't want to advertise externally, they, they don't have to. So the whole software um, has gone global now and we have had quite a few angels invest in the business. Um, and now where Snap CV sits is that um, we are about to launch in about seven days time. Um, we have gone global in the US, UK and India. And in the UK, we have over 14 million candidates on CV search via Snap. We're gonna have, and we're gonna have um, over 168,000 jobs for Snap CV in the UK. In the US, we're gonna have 69,000 jobs, and we're gonna have over uh, 11 million candidates in the US. And that will be live in seven days. 
In addition to that, we have just launched um, our Snap tool on Alexa. So we're the only one. So if you say, Alexa, find me a job, we have just launched that about four days ago. And for the UK and the US, over 150,000 jobs are launched on there at the moment. Um, and literally, wow. it, will, it, it will find you a job. So um, we've done that. And that's over, to, that's over 100 million devices for Amazon. Um, so we're the first to do that. So, so we've taken that forward. So the next phase for Snap is to go global in certain other countries and we are going for VC funding so you know we've done our angel investment now we're at a really great place the last couple of years we've had a lot of clients support us and if you go to the snap website you'll see and I think you'll see quite a few of our clients that have been using the software and you know it's been great and I think that's been one of our differentiators that Oliver Sanson comes in on the exec search space but actually we can give you snap a lot of those clients were founder members so they beta tested it for us they they got it to this level they've got it to this space and without them you know um, their support you know we, we, we've now taken it to the next level um, and now we're monetizing the project and the sales team are starting to sell the solution so um, yeah it's 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 going places that's amazing Natasha that's so cool it's, uh, do you know who Gary Vaynerchuk is? I don't actually. He's a, uh, he's a social media guru. If you find, like search him on YouTube, you'll find yeah. tons of Gary V stuff. Um, he's got one of the world's biggest digital marketing agencies, but he started out uh, with a company called Wine Library, which was selling, he basically took over his parents' wine shop in New York and he took it online and started selling wine uh, online and built it up from like a little $1 million turnover business to like 20 million or something. And, uh, then he went into social media, but, uh, that's who I first heard this idea from where in every category, like the way people search for products and services is going to change in the future. And with things like Alexa, they're just going to say, Alexa, find me a job. And, you know, there's only going to be one, you know, recommendation that comes back. And how do you position yourself so that you are the one that, you know, gets that uh, that search traffic? So that's incredible. How did, well, before we get to that, talk me through setting up a, a technology company, because that's quite a different thing to setting up a recruiting firm. Yeah, they're very, they're very different. Um, so obviously, I was one of the co-founders that helped design the product and come up with the concept. Um, because I've been in the, the recruitment space. But setting up a tech business, um, my co-founder is a bit of a tech guru. So therefore, setting up tech was not necessarily so difficult in that space. So, you know, coming up with the concept together and then setting up the business um, from the technology space. But, you know, it is a millennial business um, in the tech space. Um, it's about knowing your product, knowing what you want to establish in the software space, knowing how you want to take it to market and then mapping and putting a roadmap to Together of how do we how do we then go viral um, and what kind of individuals? So I would say to you, as Snap has grown, um, you know, a few years ago it was a concept. Today it's a product. Today it's a business. It's a fully fledgling business with staff um, globally. Um, it's gone international. Um, and what's been really interesting with Snap has been, you know, along the journey. Um, we've had a lot of interest in people that have said, yeah, this could be the next big thing. Um, and so far it has, it seems to be going that way. It, you know, we have had a lot of interest and it is going global. So where Oliver Sanderson is going to be a four to five year journey of growth and it's a bread and butter business that you grow, you know, especially in our interim markets that we're going to grow the tech business, you know, with apps, you, you haven't got an answer of what, you know, what it's going to look like in the next two, three years. Um, but yeah, we are going global. We are looking for VC funding. We have actually got some VC. We're already talking to VCs at the moment and we're going, we're going to the next level. We've been approached by, you know, a, a couple of players and, and we're, we're taking to the next level. So in about seven days, um, it'll be available, but the, the tech business to set it up was, um, it's not an easy journey. Um, because unlike um, a normal recruitment and exec search business, you see revenues pretty quick with uh, an app and with technology and software. The value comes in your users. The value comes in how you take it forward. And then you eventually do monetize the project, the whole thing. But in the in the early days, it's about how do you grow it? What do you do? What does that concept look like? And then still believing in it on that journey. So, uh, so yeah, it's really exciting. Amazing. That's, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm blown away by that. That's really cool. So um, what would you say has been 
the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in your in your business your, or your career, Natasha? Um, I'd say the biggest challenge has gone from being a recruiter to being a CEO of a business. So as I said to you earlier on today that um, I um, I used to call myself managing partner and it was about five years ago that I finally said, well, I have to change to call myself CEO. Um, and that was actually my NEDs that brought that to my attention and said, you, you know, you need to think about that. So Maria Simovic, who is one of my, who is my, one of my NEDs has been like a mentor and a friend and has really helped to gain, to, to, to take me to that next level. So, you know, I think that the biggest challenge was overcoming that you're not just a recruiter, you're running a business. How do you run a business? So when you grow a business, everyone goes, oh, well, you know, you set up a small business, it's easy to grow. No, it's not. You've got to be able to face every single challenge and you've got to be able to deliver in every space. So you go from being a recruiter, which is what you enjoy, um, you know, exec search and, you know, delivering for clients. That's the beat that I absolutely love. I can do with my eyes closed, but it's the bit about how do you manage a business? How do you grow a business? What does the strategy look like? Uh, what does the finance look like? What does the profit and loss look like? You know, what does your balance sheet look like? Um, you know, everyone thinks, oh, wow, you make all this money, but it's like, well, no, you need to understand the, you know, the strengths and the weaknesses of running a business um, and forecast for three, six, 12, 18 months. So for example, at the moment, we've got coronavirus. I have to think about not just um, the business. I've got to make sure we survive during this time. We come out and we come out stronger and better for it. I've also got to try and protect my staff and employees along the way. And that's a journey in itself. You've got to always be thinking you know, five steps ahead, not just today. Um, and that's the difference between being a recruiter and being somebody who is um, really strong at running a business, taking it forward. And it wasn't my natural veering um, and I'm still learning every day. But I, if you say to me, am I a strong businesswoman? Yes, absolutely. Have I changed over the last nine years? Yes, I have. You know, no longer am I the, the soft recruiter that I was who just delivers. I'm a businesswoman, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm someone who knows how to achieve. I know how to take a business from zero to hero. And that's, I think that's the difference in um, running your own business. Amazing. Natasha, how do you manage your time to juggle all these things? Because you're obviously, Oliver Sanderson in itself is more than a full-time job, right? Because you are, you have so many, as a CEO, you, you have to wear many hats. You are still like, working with client relationship development and business development. Um, you're also managing your team. And then you've also got the technology project. You know, what sort of hours are you working and how do you keep everything in balance? So um, I do work long hours that I'm not going to deny, but I absolutely love what I do. But I think it's about um, being really focused and putting a strategy in place of what is relevant now, what it, what can wait, um, and, and putting targets in place that you can achieve. So balancing your time. And it is also about learning to delegate. So my strategy is, you know, one of those things is the delivery part to make sure Oliver Sanson is delivering and financially flourishing on our interim and our perm exec space, you know, growing that business globally. So that's one aspect of it. Two is to make sure the business is, the overall, the, the overall business is running for Oliver Sanson. Um, and obviously for that, I've got finance director who I work closely with um, and my operations director who we take you know the strategy forward and then it's about trusting and delegating and then seeing it from macro versus micro um, but then dig delving into the detail when required and if required and then on the technology space it's actually about working closely with my co-founder who in the beginning um I would lead on certain areas but my co-founder has now taken the full fully forward on, on that side on Snap CV. So it's about working with my co-founder and our NEDs who do give us a lot of their time, such as Keith Bassnett and Maria Simovix um, and Peter McDonald and, and working with those NEDs to take the business forward in the right direction. Um, I would say on the Snap CV side, it's about me giving, you know, putting strategy in place and working with them on how do we take the business forward. The day-to-day -day running of the operations for Snap is done by my co-founder, not by myself. Um, I wouldn't physically be able to run two businesses but I do work with uh, my co-founder and the, and the NEDs um, and the business there to look at the strategy of how we're taking it to market where we're going to take it to market and why um, and obviously there's a lot of cross development so I think the key answer to that is managing your time effectively and efficiently um, there is never enough time in the day 
Um, and it's about recognizing what achievements you've achieved that week and taking it slowly. And I think the last couple of months where we've had coronavirus, it's allowed me to stop and think. Um, and I think sometimes you also need to just work, think outside of the box and have someone help guide you as to where you need to, to be. And that has been Maria, as I said, who's an NED to the business, who has helped help me focus and channel in the right way. So it's about channeling your energies in the right places and then delegating, I'd say. Um, and we're lucky enough to have a good team that we've been able to delegate to, um, to give some of that work, you know, to, to give some of that work. And, and they are, some of those individuals are founders um, and equity holders within Snap. And therefore they are also very supportive. Um, and, you know, because Snap could be, uh, you know, in an exciting place could be the next big thing. And that's why it's very different to where we sit with Oliver Sanson. Oliver Sanson is my baby. It's my journey. It's, you know, it's it's a business that we're growing. Um, and I believe our contract business will grow and we are looking to exit and sell that. But, but Snap is something that could overnight within about another year or two be sort of in a different place. And, you know, and we, we, we're all of the ethos. If you don't try, you don't know. And I think our NEDs are just as excited as we are. So we're all sort of going, this, this could be something really special. Amazing. I, uh, I, I'm excited for you to see how that goes, Natasha. And uh, I'm going to be following that closely, believe me. So w if someone wants to learn more about either Oliver Sanderson or Snap TV, then what are the websites for them to find? So www.oliversanson.com. And then the other one is uh, www.snapcv.com. And is Snap TV available already in like the Apple and uh, Android platforms. Yeah, yeah. And... App, yeah. So it's available. Um, in seven days, you will have the full on version because they've just taken it. They're just finalizing it. It was fully available to download. It was just taken off a couple of days ago. And within about seven days, it'll be fully available um, on both Apple and Android platforms. Um, because obviously we're uploading the 150,000 jobs across the, the two, the USA and the UK. Wow. Amazing. Well, in fact, this will not be published for more than seven days. So people will definitely be able to access it straight away when they, by the time they, this, yeah. uh, this goes out. So yeah. that's amazing. I'm going to go check it out right now. Okay, and, fantastic. Uh, Natasha, thanks again. Have a, have a lovely weekend. Lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for your time today.